2 News Sunday. Good evening. The manhunt narrows for the suspect. Police say lobbed a fiery Molotov cocktail into a fire truck. Police have one man behind bars tonight in the attack that critically injured two firefighters, but they're still on the lookout for another man who they say actually tossed the incendiary device into the truck. Lisa Castleman joins us now from Upper Manhattan with the latest. Lisa? Well, Carol, police say they've gotten a lot of help in this case from members of the community. As you mentioned, they have one suspect in custody and one to go. Police have arrested 23-year-old Edward Ricard, charging him with riot in the first degree. Detectives say Ricard was among the crowd that attacked a fire truck with a Molotov cocktail as it responded to a call Friday night. The scene, captured here on home videotape, shows part of the attack and the sound of youngsters clapping with delight in the background. Firefighters George Crusher and Thomas Brannigan were critically injured with second and third degree burns on their hands and upper bodies. And police are still looking for another suspect, 20-year-old Jesus Corporan, the most sought-after suspect in the whole case. We believe he is the person responsible for throwing an incendiary device at the fire engine. Youngsters in the Washington Heights area tell Channel 2 News the attack was a product of their anger, that they'd been ready to lash out at anyone in uniform. They're angry about the death of a young motorcyclist who died Thursday night after colliding with a police car that was pursuing a suspect with lights on and sirens blaring. Detectives say the cyclist, Alfredo Soto, had no license. It had been suspended 72 times, and he'd been riding without a helmet. Tonight, police are giving out this hotline number, hoping people will provide information about the suspect still at large. The number is 212-927-0675. All calls will be kept confidential. The Uniform Firefighters Association has offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the suspect. Now, once again, police say people around here have been helpful so far, and they hope that they will continue to be helpful for the arrest of Jesus Copran. Live in Washington Heights, I'm Lisa Castleman. Now back to the studio. All right, thank you, Lisa. Three teenage boys are under arrest tonight in another assault in a New York City pool. This time it happened at the Highbridge Pool in Washington Heights. Police say a gang of 10 to 12 boys surrounded a 16-year-old girl this afternoon, ripped off her bathing suit and fondled her. Two police officers assigned to the pool rescued the naked girl. Police patrols at city pools have increased since Monday when a 14-year-old girl was sexually attacked at a Bronx pool. Two teens are under arrest in that incident. In Queens, police are hunting for a would-be purse snatcher who ended up a killer. It happened in the parking lot of the Wallbaum supermarket on Francis Lewis Boulevard in Flushing. Police say a man in a station wagon tried to grab an elderly woman's purse. Her husband came to her defense, and police say the driver backed up and hit the couple, killing the husband and injuring the wife. The car was later found nearby on the Whitestone Expressway, but no arrest has been made. A Brooklyn man is charged tonight with trying to kill a store clerk and accidentally killing his own friend instead. 24-year-old David Miller is charged with murder and attempted murder. Police say he got in an argument with a clerk in a small grocery store in the Midwood section about whether the man had washed his hands before making a sandwich. Police say the argument escalated and Miller tried to shoot the clerk but killed his friend instead. During the investigation by detectives of the 63rd Precinct and Brooklyn South Homicide Squads, Miller admitted he fired this weapon. He later took detectives to the location in this house where he had secreted the gun. The store clerk was not hurt. Dozens of Muslims gathered outside FBI headquarters in Manhattan today demanding the release of Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman. Some of the Sheikh's followers are charged in the bombing of the World Trade Center and in the alleged plot against New York City targets, but demonstrators say the Sheikh himself is a peaceful man. Rahman is not charged in this country, but he is wanted in Egypt, and U.S. officials have agreed to extradite him. The heat wave continues to make headlines in our area, although today we got some relief. For the first time in three days, temperatures failed to reach the triple-digit highs, instead reaching only 95 degrees. But crowds still escaped the heat, heading to the cool green of Central Park. Pools were also packed as kids cooled off with a dip in city swimming pools. And for those who couldn't make it for a swim, hydrants were a welcome alternative. But city officials say so many have been drained that a water pressure alert continues. 
But if today was still too hot for you, there is hope ahead. Elaine Lewis joins us in a few minutes with a forecast you may appreciate. But as the East Coast swelters, the Midwest gets soaked. Floodwaters continue to batter the region, knocking out power and water in Des Moines, Iowa today. Vice President Al Gore heads to the area tomorrow to evaluate emergency response. But tonight, residents are hanging on as best they can. The thought of losing what we've built is just unbelievable. On the south side of Des Moines, residents fearing the levee will give way are packing up and moving to higher ground. Flooding along the Mississippi and its tributaries has forced more than 30,000 people from their homes and caused the deaths of 16 people since late last month. We're moving everything completely out of our house, the whole thing, everything, because we might not be able to come back. I just called all my family out of state, told them we're okay, not to worry that we'll get back in touch, but not to worry that we are okay. And we're going to lose everything. A broken dam sent the Des Moines River everywhere early Sunday. On top of that, thunderstorms pummeled the area as well. One town near Des Moines got 4.5 inches of water in just 12 hours. The Des Moines water plant was knocked out of service early Sunday when the Raccoon River rose past the plant's 15-foot dikes. The entire water supply was contaminated, and shortly after that, electricity to the plant was lost, taking pumps out of service. Residents of Des Moines and eight suburbs scrambled to buy bottled water, but many of the stores were closed because of power outages. It's terrible. It's going to, I think it's going to affect people, and they don't even know how badly it's going to affect them and for how long. It's a, a lot bigger thing than just a little community having a water problem. The extent of flooding and, and, and residents displaced and, and uh, homeowners, uh, I've never seen anything of this magnitude. And the, the old-timers I've talked to uh, say that they don't ever remember seeing anything of this magnitude. So I think this is the worst natural disaster we've ever had, to at least to my knowledge, in the history of the state. As a result of the flooding, officials estimate crop and property damage at more than $2 billion in the seven states affected. And coming up, the garbage has been piling up for days in New Jersey, but a breakthrough tonight should see it packing. And life or death talks are underway for the New York Post. We'll tell you how it's looking for the nation's oldest daily newspaper. New Jersey's long garbage strike could be coming to an end. After 11 days, union officials and trash haulers have reached a tentative agreement. Communities in 15 New Jersey counties have been without pickup service since union workers walked off the job July 1st. The tentative agreement calls for a 5% wage increase over each of the next three years. Employees would continue to pay the same for their health benefits. Union members are scheduled to vote on the agreement on Tuesday. New York Post union leaders have been behind closed doors all day, discussing deals that could revive the dying newspaper. A key player in the talks, former owner Rupert Murdoch. As Mike Taibbi reports, he's back, but he's not the paper's only hope for a new lease on life. Usually on Sunday, the staff dribbles into the New York Post building on South Street to work on Monday's edition. But there were no staff to be seen today, only a few cops and security people for well, there will be no Monday edition. The leaders of the 11 unions who would be putting the paper out were gathered instead in a Midtown hotel conference room, hoping for a miracle. Right now, uh, we get everybody's friendly on both sides, and uh, we're really trying to do this. It's not certain at this point that when Rupert Murdoch emptied the building Friday afternoon, he shut the paper down for good. The phone lines have been burning up all weekend. Governor Mario Cuomo at the end of a number of calls in attempts to keep the post alive with or without Rupert Murdoch. With debt collector Steve Hoffenberg, for example, who with partner Leon Charney wants to restructure the post by giving employees 75% of its ownership and obligations. They'll actually own the newspaper, similar to the way Avis did it when their employees bought the company. Back in February, Hoffenberg had been publisher for a minute after owner Peter Calico went under. After Hoffenberg, there was garage owner Abe Hirschfeld for a few days. After Hirschfeld, Murdoch for a second time around. If he could get a waiver, allowing him to own a TV station and a newspaper in the same city, he did. And if he could get labor savings to keep him from losing an estimated $300,000 a week, he didn't. And Friday at 4.30, he shut the doors and said he was going to walk away. But Rupert Murdoch isn't out of the game yet, at least not officially. In fact, his contract to manage the paper and to pursue an option to purchase it extends until August 30th. 
if Murdoch does make his exit official, either at tomorrow's bankruptcy court hearing or shortly thereafter, Hoffenberg insists he's ready to step in with a plan that has numbers attached to it. Well, I'm going to tell the judge from the start tomorrow morning that I'm once again the last choice player, and I don't want to play unless there's nobody else on the field. In Manhattan, Mike Taibbi, Channel 2 News. Elaine Lewis joins us next. You want to beat the heat? You may not have to wait much longer. Also ahead, reliving those glory days of summer in Upper Manhattan. When you choose a family car, you put all your eggs in one basket. So, when it came to safety engineering, Mitsubishi did the same thing. Introducing the all-new 1994 Mitsubishi Gallant. It's everything you ever hoped for in a midsize sedan. And a few things you never dreamed of. The Gallant from Mitsubishi. The new thinking in automobiles. One of these people knows some payphones are connected to operator service companies you've never heard of. Some can charge two to three times more than AT&T for card or collect calls. One of these people knows a way to avoid being overcharged is to dial 10ATT0 in the number. Which one knows all of this? The one who isn't being taken for a ride. Kiss of the Spider Woman. Winner of seven 1993 Tony Awards, including Best Musical, Best Actress, Cheetah Rivera, Best Actor, Brent Carver, Best Featured Actor, Anthony Crabello. Kiss of the Spider Woman. At the Broadhurst Theater. Call Telecharge. Psst. Are you awake? Home base is a manhole cover, and the bat is a taped-up broomstick. Call up, call up some fond memories, then you must be a New Yorker. Today in Upper Manhattan was the annual old-timer stickball block party. Those from the old neighborhood came back with their families to relive the good old days. Among them, Mayor o Hopeful Rudolph Giuliani. Great day to be outside. Uh, it was actually, there was a breeze today, which was well, marvelous. It wasn't too bad. It was a little drier today. Haven't and, felt a but breeze it was, in It was days. still hot, though. You know, we sure got up to 97 hot. degrees today. And uh, we've got one more day to get through, and then things will really start to improve. Right now in New York City, the temperature is 85 degrees, and the temperatures surrounding the city are somewhat lower in the mid to upper 70s. Now, once again, the city temperature is higher than any other place around, and that's what's called the city heat island effect. Now, what happens is during the day, the sun bakes the city. All that brick and concrete absorbs the heat just like a, a brick pizza oven uh, absorbs the fire in order to cook the pizza. And then what happens is at night, although some of that heat is lost to space, the buildings all radiate the heat to one another, too, and that traps the heat in the city, and that's why the city is so warm. And right now, 85 degrees in the city is the normal high for this time of year. What's happening is we are in a very warm air mass. The warm front has kind of crept back through again this evening, so we're back into hot and steamy air. And that is going to be with us through a good part of the day tomorrow. But then we have a cold front coming along at last. We should see some thunderstorms tomorrow night, and then things will become much cooler and drier. And so here is the forecast for tonight. Well, the humidity is on the way back, and the temperatures will be in the 70s in most places overnight. Tomorrow morning, you'll wake up to lots of nice sunshine, but the humidity will continue to increase. It's going to be a steamy day again tomorrow. And then by midday, we're looking for partly cloudy conditions, very hot and humid. We're well, going to get well up into the 90s. And then in the afternoon, those thunderstorms come through. Then in the five-day outlook, after that high of about 95 degrees tomorrow, things will begin to cool off. Now, then we have one other little problem day on Wednesday when it will still be in the 90s, but then after that, much more typical for summertime. And so everyone should be happy at last. It's coming to an you end. You might even call this good sleeping weather tonight. Yeah. Yeah, well, not too it, bad, but it'll get better. Good. Even better. I looked at that 84 degrees for Friday. Doesn't that look like wonderful? It, we haven't chill in seen that. I know we haven't seen that in so long. Okay. All right. After the break, the U.S. issues another warning to an unruly Iraq. And President Clinton honors some of America's first fallen heroes from World War II. Plus, an annual ritual that has them running for their lives in Spain.
President Clinton is back on American soil tonight after his first trip overseas as president. Mr. Clinton and his family will spend three days vacationing in Hawaii. But his first day wasn't for R&R. &R. Shortly after arriving, he headed to Pearl Harbor, where he placed a wreath at the USS Arizona Memorial. The president, who's coming home from an economic conference in Tokyo, said since 1941, our enemies have become our closest friends. However, we do have new enemies, and today there was talk in Washington of another Allied attack on Iraq. United Nations inspectors left Iraq today without getting the Iraqis to back down in the latest standoff. Iraq refused to let the team seal two missile sites and is also refusing to allow surveillance cameras. Today, Vice President Gore warned that UN forces may now be called in to destroy the site. It was a bloody day in Pamplona, Spain. Two men were gored and a third was seriously trampled in the fifth day of the running of the bull. Police say today's run was more dangerous than those at the start of the week because weekend tourists had swelled the crowd in Pamplona's narrow streets. The dangerous week-long festival dates back to the 16th century. Here at home, another centuries-old tradition which brings old world Italy to the streets of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It's called the Dancing of the Giglio, and it has its roots in the 5th century pageant that celebrates the escape of St. Paulinus from slavery. In this festival, a statue of St. Paulinus rides on top of an 85-foot tower. At the bottom is a full orchestra, and the whole thing, all four tons, is carried on the sh shoulders of what are probably some very tired men tonight. And hot. And very hot. Sports is next. Rock has highlights as the Mets host the Dodgers tonight. And the Yankees try to endure a marathon game with the Angels. So well, Rock Roke joins us now to tell us how the Yankees did today. Yeah, and if there's one team that needs a break, it is the Yankees. Just like their miserable road trip, today's Yankee game just seemed like it would never end. When it was finally over, the Bombers had endured yet another missed opportunity. They dodged several extra inning bullet plays still. Fortunately for the Yankees, the Blue Jays hit the All-Star break, singing the Blues as well. Toronto drops its fifth straight and has now lost 10 of their last 11. Today, the Rangers complete their most successful road trip in franchise history. At Baltimore, Chicago is the AL's first 13-game winner as the Sox cruise to an 11-5 victory. Tigers, by the way, lost to KC today 6-2 and remain a half game out of first place in the East. At Shea tonight, the Mets wrap up their series against the Dodgers. Doc Gooden pitched well until he made one big mistake here, and he went on to win it 2-1. to one. Golf legend Jack Nicklaus proves once again there's still more major victories left in the Golden Bears' golden years. Today, he posts career victory number 76, winning his second U.S. Senior Open. Nicklaus took the regular tour. Jim Gallagher, Jr. won the Anheuser-Busch Golf Classic by two strokes. Meanwhile, at Tahoe today, former Yankee pitcher Rick Roden wins the Celebrity Golf Championship. Shot of the day, Sports News, American Lance Armstrong wins today's eighth stage of the Tour de France cycling race. Johan Museu of Belgium remains the overall leader. I'm Rock and that Sports. See you later on Sports Update. Carol. Okay, thank you, Rock. Well, that's Channel 2 News for this Sunday. I'm Carol Ivana. And I'm John Slattery in tonight for Reggie Harris. Thanks for joining us and good night. Good night.